Yeah, okay, so you're going, you're, you're going shopping for the, uh, for the goodies today, are you? Yeah? All right. Okay, so what is it, chips or chocolate? What are your, what's your favorite? Chips or chocolate? I go chips. All right, all right. There. Happy almost Halloween. Hi. Welcome to season four, episode 23, I do believe we are uh, today, of Niagara 411 Live with Lee Sterry. We are fueled by Gales Gas Bars, supported by Verge Insurance Group, Hartzell Marine, as well as Ace Alignment, powered by WeStream, and housed lovingly at Fiddler's Poorhouse at 149 St. Paul Street in St. Catharines. And man, have we got an absolutely spectacular day, another spectacular day in a week of spectacular weather here for October the 25th. And speaking of weather, we all know the bad stuff is coming, but how bad is the stuff going to be that is coming? We hear all this stuff about El Nino and uh, and all the weather bits and stuff. Well, we're going to have Scott Sutherland coming on at about quarter to one today. We're going to be talking Niagara weather for the winter of 23-24. We'll talk El Ninos. We'll talk well everything weather from uh, uh, from the Weather Network coming up today at 12:45. Uh, um, uh, kind of a tragic incident uh, on a very popular area in St. Catharines, Arthur Street. Uh, where you would uh, take the route to head down to the beach at sunset. Uh, you're probably familiar with it in the north end. A man was shot to death by Niagara Regional Police. We're going to be talking to a member of the Port Weller Residents Association about that coming up uh, a little bit later in the program as well. And uh, we have some Halloween-y stuff with Chris Dabrowski and a bunch of other things happening here on uh, episode 24 uh, 23, season four of Niagara 411 Live with uh, Lee Sterry. So come on in, we'll uh, catch you back here in about 30 seconds. Here we go. Nice to be back with you. Uh, boy, sometimes sometimes two weeks flies by, and then sometimes two weeks seems to take forever. I guess it depends what's going on in your life. Ladies and gentlemen, on the right-hand side of your screen, the one, the only, the Kevin Jack, uh, executive producer of this here shindig that we call Niagara 411 Live with Lee Sterry, co-founder of WeStream, Canada's premier streaming service. and. Uh, You've been, uh, you were just sort of rubbing your eyes a little bit uh, this morning, Kevin. You had a long day, Niagara Falls Council, five-hour meeting oh, yesterday. Wow. Yeah, I was there to the, uh, the bitter end last night. It ended uh, <laughs> just after 9 p.m. And then also, Lee, we can get into this later in the program, but WeStream has been working with a local group of seniors that want to continue to better themselves through education. It's called Lifelong Learning Niagara. Right, yeah, and I heard about it. great group that. of individuals. If you are in the senior demographic and you, you enjoy... Um, just, you know, furthering your brain and, and opening yourself up to new ideas and continuing to learn. It's an excellent organization. That's, that's, uh, that's great. Now, we have uh, a wide open invitation for you at any time to come and join us here, um, either online or uh, in person, like Pete and Riley back here that I met a little bit earlier, fans of the program. They're in here having some lunch at uh, Fiddler's Poor House, and you're always invited in because they've always got some great food and some great deals going on. And uh, by the way, you see this here where it says, join the show live by video chat, click the Zoom link in the post. That is for you. If you are watching this, and whether it's something that we're already talking about, or whether it's something that you've had on your mind that you'd like to talk about, or let it be a business or an event that you would like to promote, by all means, that's what we are here for. We are here to do and talk about uh, whatever is important to the people of Niagara in all of our 12 municipalities, okay? So uh, think of it as an open invitation. 
All you need is a, a working internet connection with audio and video and whatever unit, phone, uh, laptop, tablet, or whatever it is you're using, and you're more than welcome to be here. Um, Kevin, we've got, uh, as I mentioned uh, in the in the preamble here before we came in, Dave DeRocco is going to be joining us. He's a member of the Port Weller Residents Association about the shooting that took place on Arthur Street over there uh, earlier in the week. Chris Dabrowski is going to be talking about night, uh, Frightmare in the Falls. Scott Sutherland, meteorologist uh, and science writer for the Weather Network, is going to be here as well as Dave DeGrave, the uh, owner-operator of one of our esteemed sponsors, Hartzell Marine is going to be joining us a little bit after one o'clock. So we have a jam-packed program, but there's always room for you if you want to join us. And Kevin, we thought we would start with uh, uh, what, what we want to call, in, in the, with apologies to Canadian uh, musical artist and writer Gowan, a smooth criminal. These people are gutsy, the things that have been taking place. Police looking to identify suspects after theft from St. Catharines, but it's not just this particular one. There have been numerous things. This was at the Pet Value on Glendale Avenue in St. Catharines. They were targeted on uh, this past Saturday at about six in the evening. Store is open. I mean, it's not closed. They didn't break in. They just walked in. The male and a female entered the store just before closing. The female distracted the employee. The male helps himself to cash from the till. But here's, here's kind of the twist here. This dude apparently had a key that would open the tell. This isn't like a smash and smash and haul and break and get, like, uh, yeah, like just, pry it open. He's got a key. This stuff's crazy, Lee. Here, take a look at this. Watch this guy. Just sort of casually walk. Talk about smooth criminal. Walks around, has a look, slides in behind the counter, ducks down, kind of keeping an eye out while his, while his accomplice is keeping the employee distracted, and he just opens the tell. Grabs the bills. I didn't even know people had cash in tills anymore, but I guess they do. And yeah. that wasn't the only place they did it. Here, watch this again. So his accomplice, who's a red-haired girl, and we'll get to her photo and in a minute. And they're off there somewhere on the other side. She's got the employee, you know, far corner of the store. Yeah. Oh, can you help me with these leashes yeah. or whatever yeah. it is? Help me find dog food, whatever. And he just slips in. Slides out the drawer, but he had a way to open it. Now, I, I'm supposing, Kevin, that these tills, these cash registers, and that's what we called them in the old days, um, have some sort of common locking system yep. that he'd be able to use it in more than one place. Well, people in the comments were suggesting that. Like, hey, I work retail, and you can't get that cash open without a, without a fingerprint. But it wouldn't surprise oh. me if he's got some sort of key, and he's targeting businesses that he knows has those cash registers. Well, I worked, uh, I, I worked at a winery here in the Niagara region, and I had, uh, I, I checked people out, used the till, it said, these are not young people, I, that guy doesn't look young. I mean, he's sort of, what, what would you say he is, 45-ish, 40-ish, something like that. Something like that, yeah, but it's... Uh, I mean, these aren't kids, it's is crazy. what so I'm saying. There's a photo of him, and people recognize that that's a Milwaukee hat. Yeah, but. And you see in the comments so many people saying that, oh, they did it to me. So here's the girl. Okay, there, now she looks a little younger than him, but I guess, I mean, photographs can be deceiving. It's hard to tell from a photograph, really, the age of people, depending on the angle and all the rest of it. So she's, the, she's sort of the, the distractor, and he is the perpetrator. And uh, it's the... It, Right, so then you the get The Bonnie into, and Clyde of cash registers. So then you get into this store out at the uh, outlet mall in Niagara-on-the-Lake. Yeah. And, I mean, I've been in this store. I think everybody in Niagara's been in this store. they got all kinds of novelty T-shirts yeah, yeah, and what yeah, have you. Yeah, and, and there's another one. That, yeah, this is another store altogether. Same couple, though. And where are they? Here he comes. Yeah, this video is a little longer, but yeah. I guess they're showing that she's at what I guess would be at the top of the frame right now, bringing the employee out right. to the far end of the store. Right. And then you'll see him. Here he comes. Right. Here he there comes. He looking is. for a, he's looking for a way in to get behind the the cash counter. Now, when you look at that screen in the middle of your picture, that's not an antiquated cash register. That's pretty modern technology. 
Yeah, but you can see him clearly here. He reaches up with some sort of key right in the middle. When he, so he's looping around again, I guess just... Yeah, just looking for a way in. And one, uh, wants to make sure where the, where the store's employees are and his accomplice, etc. So making sure that he's got access. All right, there, now, he, now he knows where he's going. Or he, wants, he knows where he wants to go. And in... All right, in he goes. Oh, there, there, there he is. He's sort of slipping his way in. Yeah, it takes him a while here. Yeah, it does, because he, well, obviously he's being careful. What I'm wondering, Kevin, is these, obviously these, these folks, well, maybe they are stupid. I mean, maybe they are stupid. But don't, don't you have to know that you're being watched in these stores, especially a store there? See, he slipped, he just, and he gently just closed the door, uh, dur the, the door to the drawer <laughs> on the on the till. Now, from what we can tell as far as patterns, Lee, it looks as though they're targeting some of these stores at night when maybe they got reduced staffing levels. So they're specifically targeting stores that only have one employee working Yeah, but they're doing the it before closing, too, which is... Absolutely. Which is when, if you're going to have any money in the till, it's going to be when you're closing. So you can look here, and the comments are... You're not going to do it at the beginning of the day. The comments are crazy, because the number of people that are coming forward and saying, yeah, I work retail, and they hit me as well, or right. they tried to. So, I mean, here's the original security footage from the pet value right right so people are doing a good job but then all of a sudden Janie comes in with this comment this is a shoe store I mean that's clearly not the pet value that's that's a shoe store yeah same yeah, yeah, guy yeah. one same of those outfit. discount shoe stores and uh, same people same they're wearing the same clothes so it's it's the same day but yet when in the other one when he was in Niagara on the lake which was a separate day guys wearing that same Milwaukee hat well yeah he's got the well, a lot of people will wear the same hat. There's a comment from me inviting Janie to come on the show. Like, yeah. I mean, people have all kinds of, you know, they're they're cropping the photo, trying to get a better look at the guy. And people talk. Uh, I saw a comment there said they should be able to get good fingerprints. Yeah, this is not Sherlock Holmes. The Niagara Regional Police, I don't think, are going to come in and dust a till for fingerprints. I really don't see that happening. Sorry. Sorry but look, here's another one. And I don't think, yeah. oh, this must be also from another pet store. I think they tried to hit one or two of the pet values. Well, maybe they're, maybe they're familiar with the way they operate. Just the number of people that came forward that had security footage of this exact couple, the redhead girl and the guy in the Milwaukee cat. Yeah. And it's, it's the same MO every time. Well, I guess you got a plan that works. Stick with it. It's pretty scary, but though, how, I think. It, well, it is, but how do you... How do these people actually believe that they are going to evade capture and arrest? I mean, how do they really believe? They're so, they're so obviously identifiable, Kevin. It's, they're just complicating other people's lives. They can't be getting very much money. Most people do not use cash to begin with. Retail operations, in my experience, uh, will always start with what they call a float. And they will have the same amount of money in their till at the beginning of the day. Same amount of cash money uh, in their till at the beginning of the day. Call it $250, $300, whatever it is, in various denominations of bills, uh, of notes, and coin. And that's what they start with every day. And then they do a balance with uh, credit, cash, debits, etc. at the end of the day to make sure that their sales balance with their activity and et cetera, et cetera. But most, most retailers will end up with not much, not much of a difference between their end cash and their float cash because this being uh, almost what we're gonna be calling soon a cashless society. I don't know, other than two, 300 bucks, what, what per per location, and I guess I guess if you need the dough, if you're an addict or something, two three hundred bucks is something. But these people didn't look like addict types for me. But what's an addict? Who, who knows? It I don't know. I just don't get robbing a retail outlet of whatever cash they have on hand. The risk involved, I don't get it. 
I, I, because there's never that much cash. It's not like you're going to end up with thousands of dollars at the end of the day. But that's... I don't know. It looks like he was that's grabbing like a pretty healthy stack out of each of those. Yeah, but a stack... What's a stack of fives, Kevin? 50 bucks? I, I mean, I, 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 I mean, t a stack of fives could be 10, 10 fives. It's only, still only 50 bucks. Let's say you got 10 20s, that's 200. You got 10 10s, that's another 100 bucks. You got 10 fives, that's another 50. So you got, like I said, 250, 300 dollars, and you're not going to bother taking the coin because that's just, that's just too unmanageable. Doesn't, idiots. All right. So <laughs> it'll be interesting to see. Uh, how quickly they get these two, and it shouldn't. If they can't pick up these two, um, our investigations are sadly lacking. Um, Dave DeRocco is a Port Weller resident. He is a, a part of the Port Weller Residents Association, as a matter of fact. And there was uh, quite a tragic incident, uh, and one still being investigated. It took place in the north end of St. Catharines on Arthur Street on October 23rd, two days ago. Officers assigned to that area, uh, went to a, an address on Melody Trail near Arthur Street in St. Catharines. Upon arrival, an interaction uh, took place between uniformed patrol officers and an adult male. As a result of that, the male was shot by police. The paramedics responded alongside, mem alongside members of the fire and emergency services. Despite life-saving me measures, the male was pronounced deceased. SIU notified and have invoked their mandate, of course, which is to investigate any shooting which involves a police department in Niagara or anywhere in Ontario. So joining us now, Dave DeRocco. Hi, Dave. How are you? Good afternoon. I'm well today. Thank you. Good, good, good. So you are a resident of, uh, of the area for sure, part of the uh, Residents Association of Port Weller. Walk us through your experience with the events of uh, Monday the 23rd. Well, my experience is, is probably typical of uh, people in the neighborhood. Um, you hear noises that you think in the back of your mind sound like gunshots, but, uh, you know, in your heart, you, you're hoping that that's not the case. Um, because it was so close and there were subsequent sirens, I, I hopped on my bicycle and went up to two blocks um, and saw enormous police presence like multiple vehicles and ems um so at that point you know i became obviously aware that something tragic had happened in the neighbor okay and so what what did you proceed to do it was obvious there was something going on something uh obviously impactful had happened what did you learn next well, I, I mean, it was one of those situations. It was an active scene having just occurred. So you certainly didn't want um, to step in and start inquiring uh, from yeah. police officers um, who were, you know, trying to mitigate the situation, but also keep people at bay. And the police tape went up pretty quickly. Right. Um, and it was disconcerting because where it happened, and, uh, we have uh, one of our ward counselors who lived right across the street from the scene. So, you know, uh, in the back of my mind, I, I, I couldn't really tell which house it was given right. the way the tape was. And which one, but, of, our uh, was which one of our counselors lives in the area? Uh, counselor Don Dodge. Oh, yeah. Okay. Counselor Dodge, yes. So, you know, you certainly are always aware of what political... Um, people have to put up with these days so sure. I, was, I was a little worried there um but i i stuck around probably about a half an hour just to kind of assess what was happening and i quickly realized that um with the with the volume of police presence there it was probably best to step away they they didn't need locals gawking at the activity right now there seems to be um quite a quite a number of differing uh, opinions or observations with regard to the incident. Um, the only thing that the NRPS mentioned is the fact that the man was shot by police. Um, but there were other comments made in the post, various postings that we saw, that there were multiple 
gunshots. Not, not one, but I think one of the comments said up to seven that they heard. Can, can you corroborate that that was somebody's experience or anything you know about that? Well, I, I, I've seen those uh, comments and heard similar comments from residents. Um, I published a newsletter down here, so I'd like to get information that I can share with residents who might not uh, have access to large media. Um, but yeah, there seem to have been multiple shots not coming from the victim. Um, it appears as though both officers discharged their weapons. Um, and, you know, I mean, certainly what I heard was multiple shots. And uh, that seems to be the case from all the other local residents who commented on what they heard. Now, is it your understanding as, as well, Dave, that the man in the residence or at the residence had a knife as opposed to a firearm that seems to be the indication i mean it's it's definitely an isolated incident in the neighborhood whenever right. gunshots are fired in any neighborhood it's it's cause for concern sure but the reports that quickly came out said that the man was armed with a knife i mean all those details are going to have to be subsequently approved by or or hopefully come out in a transparent way from the SIU. But uh, yeah, it looks like he was armed with a knife, but um, the threat must have been to the point that both officers felt um, the need to discharge yeah. their weapon. Yeah, and that's, that I'm sure is gonna be the, the crux of the SIU investigation to follow is, as, as the old line says, never bring a, gun, a, a knife to a gunfight. Uh, but obviously this man did for some reason, and to go to your point, um, the initial two officers to arrive on the scene must have felt that there was justifiable cause to take on a man with a knife while you're holding firearms. So that, that's sort of the, the disconnect that we're going to have to be pretty interested in here. Well, absolutely. We don't know yet the extent of the threat to the other individuals that were in the house. Um, I mean, it seems to be parental um, individuals for the deceased. Um, we don't know what kind of threat they were facing. I, I mean, there must have been a significant threat for um, 911 to have been activated to bring police to that particular so resident. All right, so it's your, um, it, 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 it's your understanding uh, or belief at this point that the person with the knife that is deceased was, um, what, was the son of other people that lived in the residence? That's, that's what um, I've heard. Um, I can't verify it, but it seemed to be um, really a domestic situation. Anybody that you know in Port Weller that uh, knows this family? Um, I have friends that live two doors down. Um, you know, they, they uh, gave some media comments, uh, the very the, the quintessential comment after something like this. He was a quiet man and never really bothered anybody. Yeah. Um, we don't know what, what brought the situation to the head. I, I mean, there's always the questions. You don't want to immediately judge um, police action until you oh, know all the not. detail yeah. but but, but we mean, don't know why time, they we don't know why they were initially called to the residence either do we like we, whether it was a domestic no. or something uh, but they were they were called by somebody for some reason and we don't know what that is yet no but the obvious question arises you know i mean the the action was definitely lethal did it have to be lethal um was there a possibility that the police could have simply eliminated the threat with perhaps um, a different use of the Tactic. weapon? Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, again, I don't want to question until till I get all the details, but hopefully sure. the SIU comes out so quickly. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say quickly and uh, transparently so uh, we know what happened. Yeah, uh, a public information uh, center. We have a post up on uh, our our screen right now, Dave. Just letting you know, uh, letting everybody know what's going on in in your community. 
and a public information center will happen tomorrow for the Port Weller East Vehicle uh, Access Options Group as well. This is taking a bit of a, a right turn, pardon the, pardon the pun, from our previous conversation, but this is going on in Port Weller as well because there was some, some concern amongst your association and residents in Port Weller about um, the, the ability to, if necessary, under whatever circumstances exist to, to evacuate or like get in and out, the, the accessing in and out of Port Weller, as I understand it, is a bit of a concern for, for your community. And, and I'm part of your community, kind of. I, I live not far from you, a um, little further down uh, Lakeshore Road toward St. Catharines and toward Port Dalhousie, but not, not far away. Um, and uh, and this, is, this is something that is of concern to a lot of communities these days. If there was ever a reason that we had to get out of here, there aren't a lot of exit routes, options for, uh, for Port Weller people, is there? No, and that, that meeting actually happened last night at the Bogart Community Center. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I no, that's that. all right. And um, this is something the Port Weller Residents Association has been uh, flagging for multiple years, mm -hmm. that especially in the East End with the industrial park and a marina, uh, and really only one significant access route up Broadway, there was potential, always potential, for... Um, disaster and we saw what happened earlier this year when that disaster actually happened at the sonics uh, facility there many residents were blocked in um, by fire hoses on broadway they were either rerouted out the north of access or told to stay indoors mm -hmm. um, it was a very very traumatic situation if you saw the images that came out of that explosion yeah we and, did yeah. yeah, I mean, it was overwhelming. Um, so this information night held last night has been something the city's uh, undertaken since that explosion. Um, they had uh, Scott Kozub there from the city of St. Catharines and Andrea LaPlante. She's the project manor, manager of the Associated Engineering Company that is undertaking the environmental assessment of East Port Weller. Um, just to, you know, to assess traffic patterns, uh, future traffic patterns, uh, utilities, um, impacts, and uh, what they hope to determine is the secondary access outside of East Port Weller. One of the primary concerns of residents right now is they want a two-way access in and out the majority of them wanted on Northrop, which, if you know where uh, Happy Rolfs is, of course, that side, yeah, that side road goes uh, is a direct access into East Port Weller. Um, there's a brand new subdivision there. Residential development yep. continues. There's That's just on the other side of Reed Road. There. Uh, yeah, it's in between the canal and Reed Road. It's yeah. East Port Weller. Uh, you know, probably a very one of the quietest little hamlets in uh, the city of St. Catharines. <laughs> yeah, but it is. Yeah. Yeah, this is a really vital um, uh, initiative for those residents because they definitely, the industrial park is still there. Sonics has reapplied to establish their business back in the right. industrial park. So the residents there are adamant that that secondary access point be developed and that it be two way. So where, where, night, you, where, where, where would you see that happening? Dave, I mean, you're obviously you're obviously handcuffed because you've got a big body of water called Lake Ontario uh, along <laughs> that you can't do anything about. I mean, the lake is the lake. You're not going anywhere. Um, so, how how would you see this two way access being developed? Well, it, it's Northrop. Northrop um, goes right into the neighborhood. There, there. There's a new subdivision built all around that access point, and the land right at the end of Northrop and Bromley was okay. supposed to be the final house. Um, the city has since purchased that land and has to go through this process, which is, you know, we understand the city has process. What we have been adamant about for years, um, even more so since the incident, is that it be established 
Um, the, the city had a couple of times turned down the secondary uh, access point and that particular lot was going to stay in the hands of developers and eventually wind up a house which would have blocked it up. Right. All right, so, how, so after the meeting last night, um, I'm assuming there were some next steps established. What is, what is the status of this discussion at this point? Um, citizens who are still concerned can go to the city's website at engagestc.ca, uh, which is Engage St. Catharines. They can continue to offer their input on what they would like to see happen. I mean, it's not 100% consensus because the people who live closest to that accent or, pro right. or access, we're probably hoping to see a house there, but for the greater good of the neighborhood, the majority of people are definitely in favor of a two-way access right. from Northrop out of that particular neighborhood. So have there been any feedback from the city? Uh, not yet. Um, I, I know that the Grantham Ward councillors Bill Phillips and Don Dodge have been leading the charge to get this done quickly right. um, and, and to satisfy the um, demands of the residents. Um, you know, there's, there's, the mayor was, uh, um, was there earlier this year and announced that it's going to happen. I don't know if that was a bit premature okay. because, they do, you know, they do have to go through the environmental yeah. assessment that's being done right now. But, but it's, defi um, it's definitely on the front burner. Kevin, did you have something you wanted to weigh in with here? And, and yeah, I just want to bring the conversation full circle before we let you go, Dave. Obviously, collection of Port Weller residents out there at the hall last night some of the chatter had to have been about the NRP incident on Melody Trail there on Monday night. Um, what were people talking about? Well, there was comments, absolutely. And on the Port Weller Resident Association Facebook page, there were some comments about about the greater concern, like this, the, the state of the city of St. Catharines and how incidents like these are indicative of a greater malaise in the city. I mean, last night, talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, of course, they're concerned whenever gunshots go off, but the majority right. understand that it was an isolated incident. Um, you know, it's under police investigation. It's not going to be an ongoing threat to residents, but anytime there's um, a shooting involving police, especially, um, and a victim, um, people are you know, concerned, and yeah. they, they ultimately just want to know what happened. All right, uh, I have one more quick question for you, and then we're going to let you go, Dave. I appreciate it. Um, you mentioned the fact that you publish a newsletter for um, concerned citizens uh, that live in the area, uh, and uh, I'd like to know what that newsletter is. If somebody wants to have access to uh, the information, how do they how do they find the newsletter? How do they get you to send it to them? Oh, that's, uh, well, I would love that. Uh, they can send an email to portwellerra, standing for Resident Association, at gmail.com. I publish it six to eight times a year, depending on activity. Okay. Uh, you know, when I started it, it was one page. The last edition was 25. There's a lot going on in East and West Port yeah, Weller. Well, I, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm going to access it myself uh, so that I can keep in touch with things that, uh, as you say, don't make it to maybe the major media. So it's portwellerra at gmail.com. Yes, sir. Awesome. Thank you. Dave DiRocco, appreciate your time uh, and effort and uh, everything you do. And uh, say hi to all the folks in uh, Port Wellers <laughs> for us. We all definitely right. will. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Okay. Take care, Dave. And you know, it just goes to show you, as they say, Kevin, that things can happen anywhere. It doesn't matter how comfortable and cozy an area would appear or has the history of being. Life can reach out and grab you at any time from any direction and uh, not so that people should be paranoid all the time, it's just that uh, you can never be confident that Ah, it couldn't happen to me, couldn't happen here. It can happen anywhere. Chris Dabrowski is the uh, horrorific organizer of uh, Frightmare in the Falls, Canada's largest horror convention. It's coming up. <laughs> and there he is. Chris, how, uh, 
How yeah, are you? Breathe. It has a lot of holes in it, but there's no hole for your for your mouth. <laughs> no, fun. no. Thanks for having me on. Hey, get uh, it's uh, you know what I was, uh, Chris. You are um, one of the one of the drivers of so many events uh, in the Niagara region. And I was saying to Kevin before we went on the air when we were talking about the fact that you were going to be here, is the fact that my gosh. You have to have an awful lot of energy to do the job that you do because you're you're constantly promoting, you're constantly digging, you're constantly planning, you're con constantly organizing, constantly. Where do you find the energy and, and and the and the continence to do this stuff over and over again like you do? How do you do that? I think at this point it's almost ingrained in, in how I live and how I breathe. I. Uh, we have a, a great team behind us. It's, it's James Potts, and I, I, I'd i be remiss not to mention James's name. We have a, an amazing team behind us and uh, a lot of volunteers. When we run these these events, there's thousands of people in attendance, and it yeah. takes hundreds of, of arms and legs and, and minds that work together, and it's our team here in the office and the hundreds of volunteers that, that support us each year that, that really make it happen. And I don't think I've been to an event in the past 20 years where I don't look at the rigging, or the attendance or the flow of traffic i as much as i try hard to enjoy an event for what it is i just i don't have it in me i look at it from the organizer standpoint so well it's, it's like really it yeah it's i mean it's like any of us that have been in, in an industry for a long time for example i was in radio for 40 some odd years i can't listen to the radio anymore because it's too much like work exactly, so. <laughs> exactly. And, it, and this doesn't work we, we wake up Every morning I run to the office. Uh, you don't have to get me out of bed. And uh, what we do is it's a fun job. Um, we, we make a lot of people happy. We put a lot of smiles on people's faces through the events. Through COVID, it, it was a, a rough time for everybody. Yeah. But now that we're enjoying the, the public events again, it's just it's a great experience. And, and we really do truly enjoy what we do. Tell us about Frightmare in the Falls. It really is Canada's largest horror event. It's not just a marketing ploy. It's uh, it's an event that came out of Niagara Falls Comic Con. Um, we all, always had a horror component to Comic Con, and it's something that fans were loyal. They came out in droves, and and James and I decided that seven years ago that Niagara Falls needs to have its own horror specific event, and that's when we created Frightmare in the Falls. And and seven years later, we're we're drawing thousands of people to the city thousands of people to the convention center to celebrate all things horror and there's lots to celebrate when it comes to the horror genre boy there is i mean you you you're wearing the the mask at the beginning and uh, i mean there's the, the there's the freddy krueger the nightmare on elm street there's and then you go all the way back and then people are such people are such fans of uh not just the genre as a whole the history of the genre as well. I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis, for example, one of the greatest horror queen actresses of all time. I mean, she she, she made her career starring in B, C, and D movies in the horror genre, and people just love that stuff for some reason. It's just unbelievable. It, it's celebrated, and the fans are very loyal. This year at, at Frightmare in the Falls, we're celebrating 45 years of Halloween. We have a Friday the 13th reunion. Um, Art the Clown, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that brand, but Terrifier is supposed to be the, the new Nightmare on Elm Street. Art the Clown's uh, a big fan favorite. So we're celebrating 50 years plus of horror. Um, this year, actually next year, marks the 50th anniversary of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Wow. There's been a ton of reboots, but we, we have the original cast coming in. Friday the 13th Part 4, I think, was probably released in the mid-80s. So the fans are loyal. They're celebrating movies that were directed and written and produced in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. It, it's pretty amazing to see the loyal following that horror fans do have. And there's so much to celebrate. And we don't get to do it a lot throughout the year. I uh, I look at the, the spooky season now is is really the season. We have the spooky awards in Niagara Falls. You have Halloween. We have a, a ton of haunted houses in Niagara Falls. Just ask Ted Mouse if he's all about that. And, and we're home to... Uh, Frightmare in the Falls, which is a huge horror event here in the country as well. So I think Niagara Falls is slowly becoming the horror mecca of Ontario and well, Canada. Well, I mean, Niagara has always, Niagara Falls in particular, uh, Clifton Hill, uh, I mean, has always been uh, an area of extremes when it comes to entertainment and, and frightening things. 
have always yep. been at the core. I mean, there's the Frankenstein Museum downtown. There's the, the Tussauds Wax Museum with the Hall of uh, Horrors, the Chamber of Horrors that they they had there. And I mean, it's it's been a part of the DNA of uh, the entertainment sector in, the, uh, in, in Niagara Falls for a long time, but it sort of bubbled under the surface. It's never been quite as maybe vibrant as, as you and your group have helped make it over yep. Over the over the years, what are the what are the ticket prices? How do we get them and all that? I know we had a graphic up on the screen a little bit earlier, but uh, give us the nuts and bolts of attending this starting twenty uh, seventh, which is on this Friday night. Starts Friday three p.m. Runs all weekend. Friday, Saturday, Sunday at the Niagara Falls Convention Center. The steps away from the majestic Niagara Falls. You can get tickets online, brightmarinthefalls.com. You can also get them at the door. It's an event, even if you're a quasi horror fan or you're not sure what to expect, it's something you literally should come and check out. There's hundreds of vendors, 40 plus celebrities, costumes, um, a haunted house that's free with paid admission. You get to see movie props, memorabilia, Q&A panel, for legend, something for everybody. Even if you're not into horror and you're thinking about it, come on down. Special celebs uh, this weekend, anybody of note that you want to mention? I, It's almost like Frightmare in the Falls has become, it's a horror specific event, but we have Ron Perlman who, uh, who's best known for Clay and Sons of Anarchy, of course played Hellboy. Corey Feldman, who's going viral as we all know right now. He was in The Beauty and the Beast Alex. on TV too, wasn't he? Beauty and the Beast on TV as well, Perlman. Uh, Carrie Elwes from the Saw franchise, uh, Corey Feldman from Friday the 13th, The Goonies, Lost Boys. You name it, There's, I think we've covered every horror movie, genre, title in some capacity. Check out the website, though. Click on Celebrity Guest, FrightmareInTheFalls.com. It's something you don't want to miss in, here in Niagara. All right, that's that's very cool. Chris, like I said, I don't know where you guys uh, and ladies uh, get your energy from, but you got it has to be a bit of a labor of love for you. And, uh... Monster drink. <laughs> there, yeah, there Lots you of go. Monster. Coffee's always rolling food. Monster sauce. All right. Yeah. Uh, thanks for being here. Good luck with the event. Uh, as always, I'm sure it'll be awesome. And we'll, I know we'll talk again soon. We will. Thanks for your support, Lee. Thanks, man. Take care. You too. We're becoming uh, quite a center for these kinds of conventions and cosplay things and like Comic Cons and, and those kinds of things. Uh, and, what, and why not? I mean, look at the setting that we've got here in Niagara. All the, all the beautiful places that we have to celebrate all of these uh, different events. Gales Gas Bars Limited, thank you very much for being uh, the primary fuel behind this program. And I know that's kind of a play on words, but it kind of feels right, and it's true. As they've been fueling Niagara for more than 50 years, they fuel this program each and every week. And uh, we thank them very much for that 2023 award winner uh, in the Impact Awards of inclusivity um, uh, from convenience stores of Canada and Ontario. So thanks, Gales, for, uh, for being our headline sponsor here on Niagara 411 Live with Lee Sterry. Also, to Verge Insurance Group, you are, ha, have been with us for quite a long time as well, uh, quietly supporting this program for so long, and we thank you for doing that as well for all your insurance needs, home, car, auto, whatever. Uh, did I say car and auto in the same sentence? Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Beau Chapeau Hat Shop. Uh, I stopped in there again on uh, this past Sunday to have a look around. Man, there's a lot going on there. So to Kevin Newfeld and your gang, uh, uh, nice to keep my dome covered. Appreciate that. Queen Street, right downtown. Beau Chapeau Hat Shop. Check it out. At any one time, maybe 10,000 ways to cover your head. Uh, it's amazing. And uh, Ace Alignment, thank you very much for also being uh, a part of this uh, program over the last couple of months. It's been just super to have you on board, so stop by anytime and say hi uh, to Head Mechanic Darren Miller, Senior Mechanic Matt Crompton. They will look after any and all of your automotive needs, wheel alignments, brakes, suspension. They're also uh, an MCO in, uh, inspection station. Uh, oil changes, servicing all makes and models of trucks, cars, SUVs, including classic cars and tuners, etc. So uh, check them out. They are uh, here in St. Catharines on North Street. All right. Um, and Kevin of WeStream, Canada's premier streaming service, 
you've been busy boys lately. You and Brandon, your partner, and uh, your support staff and whatnot. You guys have been uh, really up against it lately as far as uh, work level is concerned. Yeah, we're very happy, Lee, that uh, coming up in the next couple of months, we are going to be supporting some of the municipalities. We'll be um, Saturday is Remembrance Day this year, November 11th. And we'll be helping the city of Niagara Falls and the city of Port Colborne broadcast their Remembrance Day ceremonies live to members of their community and beyond. So if you can't make it out, and of course I would encourage all municipalities to start live streaming their public gatherings and make them accessible for all. And then of course uh, we're doing a few Santa Claus parades coming up in December. So again, these are just awesome opportunities for people of the community who for whatever reason can't make it out to these events. You can still really feel a part of it through the live broadcast or the archived. I mean, Last few years, we've done the Grimsby Santa Claus Parade. This year, it looks like we'll be partnering with the city of Port Colbert as well. Excellent. And for our family, Lee, we actually watch them at home, and it doesn't take away from it at all. Like, we watch it at home sometimes weeks after the fact just to get in the, in the, in the, in the Christmas spirit. Well, look at, how, look at for how many years so many of the major parades from the big cities, like uh, Macy's Day Parade in, in New York, Santa Claus Parade in, in L.A., and, uh, and the Rose Bowl, and places like that. People love that stuff, and now you have a way to do that, to experience that here in Niagara, thanks to uh, WeStream, a company, because nobody's actually done it the same way or as often in all of the different communities that we have here in Niagara. Like, uh, like your company, yeah, and and we, you mentioned uh, Remembrance Day, and I think that in particular, because we're here at that time of year again, is very important, because many of the people, many of our citizens uh, across the country, but we're talking about Niagara in particular, uh, are of an age. When you think about how long ago those two major wars were. Many of those people are of an age, or the offspring of those people are even of an age, where it's not all that convenient. It's not all. It's not easy necessarily to attend these these events and these acknowledgments and of of the people that paid the ultimate price. So to be able to to be able to be comfortable in your home, your residence, wherever it is you are, uh, and be able to share those remembrances it's a big deal for some people it really is because i have i spent many in in my line of work and kevin you as well have, we've spent many many a remembrance day on site uh for in-person um acknowledgements uh, of of remembrance day and the people in that crowd often labor extensively to be able to attend these things because a lot of them are quite elderly so to be able to access, to be able to be a part of that, to still feel engaged and, and not have to feel that you can't go, that's important. That's a big deal for people. So thank you for what you do. Hey, you know, we don't take that lightly, Lee. Each year I love getting some of the comments and reading them online from people like you just mentioned who thank the community for, hey, thank you for broadcasting this. I couldn't get down there. Yeah. Haven't been able to get down there for years. So thank I you mean, for just, making just, it. I mean, just down the street at St. Catherine's Cenotaph. Um, the the Well and Third Regiment uh, band comes out, and the the legions are well represented, and there are uh, dozens and dozens of wreaths laid at the Senate half, and there are usually, oh I don't know, it's been my experience over the last few years, there might be 250 people uh, show up, but there are thousands more that would like to be there, and the fact that you can bring those people in so that they can be there. That's a big deal. No, I appreciate that, Lee. And you know what? Um, I just don't want to run out of time before we mention this. And I'll just throw it up before we get to Scott Sutherland from the Weather Network. Yeah. Is WeStream has been partnering with Lifelong Learning Niagara. And I mean, it says it right there. A third age learning organization providing learning programs and experiences for adults 50 plus in Niagara. And it is exactly that. Um, if you are somebody that likes to be engaged mentally, if, if you're somebody that wants to continue to learn and enjoy new experiences even though you might be getting on in years uh there's opportunities to do that and lifelong learning niagara puts together a great program some are live in person some are virtual we help them with the virtual aspect but if you want to find out more information i mean that's the best place to start right there just go to lifelong learning niagara or lln 
on, uh, on Facebook. Yeah, and you know, uh, as we get older, we always hope that uh, we're going to be able to retain our mental faculties for as long as we possibly can, and an organization like this will help you do that, help keep you engaged uh, and, and, and learning new things. Scott Sutherland uh, has not been with us uh, for a while. Uh, he's, he's sprouting some new whiskers since the last time we saw him months and months ago, maybe even a year ago now. Meteorologist and science writer for the Weather Network uh, joins us because we've got a, we got a winter coming up. Scott, how are you today? Nice to see you, mate. Yeah, great seeing you too, Lee. You know, it we, has been a while, yeah. We, we were talking about um, something earlier where people are, are so engaged with certain things. And I'll never forget uh, decades ago, I guess it is now, when the, network, when the weather network became a thing. I was always surprised at the fact that people could sit in front of their television set, now maybe in their computer, but they, they would sit in front of their television set and actually watch a weather channel. Yeah. yeah. Like, that always amazed me. And people still do that. Yep. It's a, it's a very popular channel. Yeah. <laughs> like, how do you watch the weather all day long? Uh, hey, Martha, yeah, come I on, mean, the weather's on. Yeah, like, I mean, wow. I mean, the, the music is very soothing, first of all. <laughs> uh, but yeah, things are going, and our, our, our on air people are very entertaining. Um, I've known several of them for. Uh, half my life now, and they're all wonderful people to well, watch. So it, yeah. it's a uh, it's it's the Pelmerex organization that has owned that thing from the be beginning, uh, yep. a longtime broadcast uh, uh, and uh, a niche cast company uh, in the world of media uh, in our country. So um, kudos to a, working for a very very successful organization. Everybody there, uh, we we sort of take th places like the Weather Network for granted uh, because you're always there. But yeah, uh, yeah. but there's a lot of great work being done, and some of the science articles that you write, notwithstanding the whole weather thing, is some pretty interesting right. stuff. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I this is I, I mean, I've worked for the Weather Network in a number of different uh, jobs. I was a meteorologist for them, and now I'm a science writer. Um, yeah. But the uh, yeah, being able to just keep learning new stuff as I write these articles is is amazing. So your company, your company, and uh, some of your fellow coworkers that uh, work full time on the weather side of the thing, uh, have been. Uh, this is the time of year when winter forecasts are yeah. are a big deal, and one of the biggest deals, r whether it's the Weather Network or other sources, um, yeah. are talking about this El Nino thing, right? And the fact that it's a pretty it's a pretty big El Nino thing this time uh, around not that yeah. any are small but this is uh, going to be a, as i understand it fairly significant so i wanted to have yeah. you come on and talk about what we in niagara in particular might be able to expect from our winter which is just now yeah. days and or weeks away so walk us walk us right. through this thing uh scott walk us through the the winter that yeah. your people think we can expect here in niagara Okay, so um, usually on, a, on a, you know, your average year uh, when winter comes around and temperatures decrease, they go get dipped down into the freezing, we get snow, we get lake effect snow, uh, ice, you know, and it's, and it's cold through the entire season. Yeah. But when, in, when an El Nino develops, you get this big warm blob of ocean water towards, that, that shifts back towards South America. And that kind of pushes all the warm air that's around that area away from that area. So it, it expands outward. And so it gets over us over here in Canada. And so throughout most of Canada, we see a warmer winter, at least to start, when you have an El Nino developed. Because that's the reason why it's called El Nino is because it develops around Christmas. That's when you really start to see things, uh, the effects of it. And that's El Nino is the, the, the child, the Christ child. Okay. So, um, so what we're expecting at the moment, due to this development of this El Nino, is that we're going to have a, a mild winter to start. And then from there, so, so December uh, will be fairly mild. There will still be some shots of cold air because we can't escape winter completely in Canada. It never happens. <laughs> no. But... Um, so we'll get a, a, an occasional shot of cold air. I mean, think back to 2020. It was mild all throughout the winter until Christmas Eve. 
and then we got a huge burst of snow. Yep. So it's it's entirely possible we'll see that a couple of times. But mostly people will remember this as a fairly mild December. Okay. The thing is, is that this particular El Nino is developing a little unusually this year. And so um, it may shift into this special type of El Nino called a midoki. That oh, is here's all the that warm air kind of shifts into the middle of the Pacific. All right. A and, madoki. Uh, so what is this going to do? Now? Yeah, so the, uh, an, a madoki El Nino is one where that, that warm blob of temperatures in the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, shifts over towards the middle of the ocean okay. rather than closer to South America. And so it pulls that warm air back with it. So if that happens, we may see a transition later in the season to more, a more typical wintry weather, snow, cold, so forth. But it just depends on how fast we make that shift. It could be a really rapid shift, and then January, February, and through March, we have cold weather. It could be a gradual one, so it's only towards the end of the season we see that shift. Uh, so right now, I mean, we our national official winter forecast comes out uh, November 29th. So we've got another month or so that we're going to keep looking at these things, keep examining what's happening with the El Nino to see if there's any clues as to how quickly that shift will happen. All right. Uh, now, why is this Maduki, Madoki? It seems that we learn a new weather word or yeah. term every yeah. year. There's a new term. I remember uh, yeah. I hadn't heard my entire life a thing called the polar vortex. Yeah, I knew you were going to ask that one. Yeah. Until until a handful <laughs> yeah. of years ago, and all of yeah. a sudden we got we got like Dave Phillips, and we got all the, yeah, one yeah. of Canada's great meteorologists, and all the all the folks from yeah. uh, from the Weather Network talking about polar vortex. Yeah. What the hell yeah. is a polar vortex? Well, now we're familiar with it, this yeah, whole yeah. blast, of it. but now we got this Maduki, Medeki. Where Madoki. the hell did that come from? Madoki, that's been around for a while now. It's just it doesn't happen very often. All right. Uh, we, we saw one of these types of El Ninos a few years back, but before that, I don't remember hearing about it either. It was only that, <laughs> that, that, that I learned about it. I knew a lot about El Nino, but I didn't know about these specific kinds until it happened because it had been, it had been researched and it's named after the researcher, I believe, or it's a, it's a more as a reference to the central. Well, it part. sounds like, it sounds like a Japanese uh, term to begin. It with. is, it is. Yes. So, um, so then, then, and now we're having one that maybe happen now. So it's becoming more of a buzzword again. All right. But, uh, yeah. But even um, even even El Nino and El Nina uh, are terms ah. that, I mean, they're part of our lexicon now, but they weren't yeah. for a long time. And it seems, are, are these El Ninos or uh, uh, are these things connected at all? Here, I know we're going to get into a controversial uh, opinion right. thing here. Right. Are these things related to climate change, the, the climate change conversation at all? Because it seems like we hear more about El right. Ninos uh, than, than we used to. How do these El, things El Nino, collide? El Nino's been going on forever, basically. As long as the planet has had oceans and the continents the way we know them today, right. uh, El Nino has been happening. It's just a normal process. of, of It's a large-scale weather pattern that, of shifting weather back and forth across the Pacific. Right. Um, it was the 1997-1998 when that really caused it to galvanize in our, in our you know, minds, because that was the strongest one that we'd ever had in, on record. So that's what really brought this to mind, is, yeah. is when that, then, because I don't remember that we would have them on such a regular basis as we do now. Yeah, so that's the thing is that even though El Nino and La Nina themselves are, na are natural phenomena, um, we're starting to see signs that they're being influenced by climate change. Like right now, this particularly strange developing El Nino now, um, the, the ocean temperatures are already really, really warm this year. Uh, it's, it's so warm that it's contributing to the fact that this is now the hottest year on record and the year isn't even over yet. Is that what makes this what you so, call it a strange development? It could be a strange development, yeah. No, but, but, but you said that it's developing strangely or more strange than normal. More unusually than you, because there's typical signs in the ocean and the atmosphere and they, how, they, how they react to one another 
that that's a regular sort of pattern for the development of an El Nino. This one isn't following right perfectly along with that. It's kind of lagging in the atmosphere and it's a little bit further ahead in the ocean temperatures because the oceans are already so hot. Okay, so you mentioned the fact that we're probably going to be um, milder to start with. Does that also yep. mean less? Because you can have mild temperatures and still have a fair bit of snow. Does this also mean we're not going to get much snow early in the winter? I, I would think that we'll most likely see more rain for this December All right. uh, when it comes to precipitation. But we might we might see a few shots of snow because all I mean all it really takes is a good wind off the lake and 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 some temperatures near zero. Yeah. Or for Niagara region to get snow. So, okay. So um, so an easy sort of an easy start to winter as we would term it, uh, but yep. the the uh, the benchmark date for you right now or for us as far as looking forward for the rest of the winter is November 29th. Yeah, that's when we'll have a, a better idea of what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, we'll have we'll be a, a, at least a month long uh, in our idea of exactly how this El Nino is develop developing. It might give us a few more clues as to what it's up to. Uh, and, All right. and cool. how things might develop, and then and then we'll see. But yeah, mild to start, and then but it could finish off with a very typical winter. It just depends on when that's going to shift over. Let's let's dip our toe uh, a little bit before while we have you here and we have the benefit yep. of uh, of your presence. Uh, dip our toe a little bit into the area in which you spend most of your day job uh, involved with, and that is the science side of things. And yeah. we've talked about all kinds of. Uh, uh, astronomical happenings uh, in the past and uh, we've got one coming yep. up we've got the Geminid uh, meteor shower happening yeah um, when is that uh, it's in early December uh, is when it peaks okay. um, but it starts it starts at around mid November or so and then it, it goes through mid December uh, and this is probably uh, you want to uh, actually you want to bookmark probably the uh, the night of the December 13th as the peak okay. of the gem of the Geminis. And that is probably yeah, the December thirteenth to fourteenth. All right. And this is one of the best meteor showers of the entire year. Uh, we hear about the Perseids a lot because mm -hmm. it's middle of winter, middle of summer and it's really nice weather and it's great to stay out late. Um, and that that's there's a lot of fireballs with that one and a lot of meteors. This one is probably the most consistent and uh, colorful meteors and the most meteors that you can see per hour just by sitting out. And the nice, the, if you get a clear night on that night, I mean, it's, I think so just December 13th, 14th, the, what, would be, what would be good hours of the, of, of the night or morning or whatever to bundle up and go out and have a look? All night long, I would say. Anytime uh, after dark. Anytime after dark is cool. great for the Geminids. All right. Yeah. And uh, one run real quick thing and then we'll kick you yeah. off is uh, we've got an eclipse coming up in April to put on our calendars, right? Yeah, yeah, this, this is the big one. I mean, Niagara is especially well-placed for this eclipse. I mean, this is the first eclipse that will pass over this area since, um, well, uh, it must be hundreds of years, I think, for this particular area, okay. but over, over cool. southern Canada since 1979. And Fort Erie is probably the best place to go, or Welland, because not only will they have a great view if they are in clear skies, I hope, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Fingers crossed. But um, they'll have the longest view of the eclipse for pretty much all of Canada. Cool. Yeah, and, and Scott, so, I mean, I first heard about this from Niagara yeah. Falls City Council. To give you an idea how significant this event is, the city yeah. already has preparations in place to deal with the influx of people. And, I mean, Niagara Perfect. Falls is already set up. For yeah. influx of people, wow, they're expecting, I didn't know that. They're expecting yeah. thousands more for all yes. the reasons that Scott just explained. Yeah, exactly. I mean, well, my, we'll, my definitely, friend Mark Rob we'll definitely right. have you on in April. Yeah, I mean, uh, my friend Mark Robinson and I will be probably, I think, around Welland or Fort Erie, somewhere in that area, uh, to broadcast the eclipse. Um, we might switch locations if it's cloudy, but uh, but I'll be we'll be going through all of that in more detail. I'll have an article up in, in the next week or so yeah. to give full details about right. planning and everything. So well, maybe Niagara Four One One Live at least Terry can do a special show, and we'll we'll do an eclipse broadcast. How about that? Yeah, that'd be great. All right, very cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. Scott Sutherland, a science writer, a meteorologist uh, with the Weather Network. Uh, it's been too long since I've seen you. Thanks for coming on the show. Same here. Stay you're well, uh, and uh, one of these times we'll talk about all that geeky stuff that's behind you, because I, I know you're still in that uh, Lego 
uh, crazy world. So there's a lot of stuff you have going on. Thanks for being here. Yeah, you're welcome. Take care. Bye. Take care, Kevin. Take care, Scott. Yep. Bye-bye. All right, lots of things going on. Yeah, Lee, a couple updates on the show here. Uh, coming up, our musical guest at the end of the show going to be a brand new video from uh, Joe Lavoy. Joe uh, Lavoy, yeah, wow, I love Joe. Good to say, Catherine's guy. We featured some of his music and videos before. This is a brand new one, just got released uh, 15 hours ago. So just yesterday, he uploaded this. Cool. And it's called Retrace. So All right. it's a good song and a nice little kind of animated video to go along with it as well. And in about five minutes' time, we're going to talk to Dave DeGrave of Hartzell Marine. And auto service, find out everything that they do up there on Ormond Street South in Thorold. Indeed. Um, Lee, I know you wanted to touch on this, and I'll kind of let you go from here, but big announcement from the region yesterday. I saw it through Mayor Matt Sisko's Facebook feed, um, but they're setting up a temporary homeless shelter just right. over where, and I looked on the map. You can look on the map here, but I'll let you do the story. It's right across the road from where Jack Gatecliff Arena was. So there was that parking lot over there okay. across from Start Me Up in behind that convenience store. Right. That's where they're going. And here, I'll let you get to the store. And we don't know, and we don't really know all of the details about how this is, how this is going to uh, flesh out, uh, except for the fact that, of course, housing, housing, and housing uh, have been the top three issues. And I did that a little bit tongue-in-cheek, I know, of not only municipal, but provincial and federal governments and cabinets and lobby groups etc it is probably the single biggest red flag on the play of societal existence these days is housing and then when you boil it down through the funnel it's not just housing for um, people that maybe can't afford a down payment on a, on a on a big house or whatever and they're renting it's housing for people that have none I mean, it's, it's not just affordable housing for people that are on the edge or just can't quite meet the bills and go get down payments, et cetera. It's for people that have no housing. So we go from no housing to, to low-income housing to barely income housing to God knows. So housing is the thing. So there are plans, um, not maybe as concrete as you would like them to be, uh, for long-term solutions. To our housing issue but in the short term there needs to be some kind of plan as well and here's where this story comes in and where the rubber hits the road the region continues to make what they call important progress on providing housing supports to people experiencing homelessness in niagara niagara region is establishing this temporary housing focused 50 bed modular shelter uh meaning sort of um easy to put up and easy to tear down, easy to move. It's pre-made and then put up, modular. Shelter at 29 Riordan Street. And as Kevin said, Riordan Street is in the, uh, in the general area of where the arenas in downtown St. Catharines just came down. It'll be operational in early 2024. The site will remain open for approximately two years, while my previously mentioned permanent year-round shelter solution is being established in a location yet to be determined and that is still being debated at uh, provincial and municipal levels as well. Modular housing units provide a unique and rapid solution that allows the region to advance recommendations made in a recent shelter capacity review. The decision to build on this location is based on several important factors like zoning, access to transit and support services for clients also make this neighborhood ideal. This site is determined to be safe and at an appropriate distance from other vulnerable populations. Um, and I know those are a bunch of buzzwords. However, it just, it's one of those things as a temporary solution. It may not be a site for a long-term solution. One of those sites has also been uh, rumored to be the site of a new, a new fire hall in, in downtown St. Catharines. But for now, I guess it, it falls in the general uh, vicinity of it kind of makes sense. Like when, when, all things are, when all things are boiled down, it kind of makes sense. Because we have an awful lot of members of that community that are already kind of sort of residing or hanging around that area. So it makes sense that it's, that it's there. And we also have the, uh, the, the public toilet. <laughs> 
You know what? The, it's easy, we have it's, the public toilet. It's easy to criticize, but they're doing something. And I yeah. know for a long time, you have people, to do something. People have been saying, you know, we got to do something. So yeah. while you may be critical and say it's not perfect, it's something, and something is a great step forward from nothing. Kevin, when it when it comes to talking uh, homelessness, there is no perfect solution. There is no one solution because there is no one element that all of the people affected by this issue fall into. You can't put them all into the same can and expect them to all have the same solutions. No. It's impossible. You're absolutely right, and I, I'm just happy to see this step forward yeah. from the Niagara region. It's and something. It's something. Exactly. exactly. Uh, and it, it, it's, not, it's not the holy grail, but it's something. It's a step. Joining us on the program uh, is uh, one of our sponsors, and we're very, very happy to have had Hartsville Marine sponsoring us the last number of weeks and months. Uh, Dave DeGrave uh, is, uh, is the big cheese head dude, operator, owner, founder of Hartsville Marine uh, on Ormond Street in Thorold, and he joins us now. Dave, how are you? Very well, Lee. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, and. Uh, You've been uh, you've been in business uh, quite some time, uh, serving this community in the in the boating world, and uh, I was wondering if you could just give us a little bit of uh, history. Tell us about you and uh, and the history of Hartzell Marine. Uh, tell us about yourself. Um, I started my apprenticeship, uh, my car apprenticeship, right out of high school, and worked at a lot of dealerships over the years. And uh, in two thousand one, I decided to start my own business and was. Hartzell Auto on Hartzell Road. Um, after a few years, um, I had my boat in there, and um, people kept asking me, and you fix boats, and which I replied, no, I wasn't really into it then. But enough people asked me, so I did my research and found out that there was a need in this area for it. There wasn't a lot of boat repair places. So when uh, we moved to Thorold in 2010, um, I started Hartzell Auto and Marine. And in March of 2020, we became a legend in Mercury dealership. So I focused the business mostly on the marine repair and sales now. And we still do car repair, but it's, it's mostly the marine stuff that's taken over. Right. So I've got a number of questions for you. I want to ask you this way. How does, now Mercury, Mercury Marine I've heard of for forever. I mean, I, I remember as a kid, uh, tooling around in a, in a small 12-foot aluminum boat with a mercury motor on the back, et, et cetera. Where does the legend boat connection come from? You're Niagara's only authorized legend boat dealer. How, tell us about the legend uh, relationship. Uh, legend legend uh, only puts mercury motors on their boats. So they kind of go hand in hand. Oh, okay. You could buy a, a legend boat and put your you know, Yamaha or whatever you wanted on it, but Legend prefers Mercury. They have, have they're kind of married. At, so okay, very interesting. Um, now, as far as uh, your business is concerned, I know you're a you're a big part of the community and have been for for some time. What are what are some of the community relationships and impact that uh, Hartzell has had in in Niagara? Well, for the last eight years, I've been vice president for the local chamber of commerce here in Thorold. Which, which has been great. We've got to meet a lot of people in business and, and you know, and, and see how their businesses work and operate. So it's nice to be involved in the community. We, we sponsor some hockey teams and uh, we're involved in the Stoppers and Mobile Closet. Um, also, St. Catherine's Game and Fish, and we sponsor some salmon derbies and fish, kids' fishing derbies. So it's, it's nice to get back. There's nothing better than to see a smile on a kid's face when he catches his first fish. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's something special and it's something that, um, I mean, I know you're a pretty, um, pretty big dealership. However, in our, in our terminology in Niagara, you're an independent business person. You're an independent business. We still think of this as what we refer to as small business, and that's important to Niagara, and because you're connected and you have a chance to give back, and that's really great. So thank you for the stuff that you do. Um, now, what kind of, we've got a lot of water in, in, in Niagara, and 
We live in neighborhoods where you drive around, you see a lot of people with all kinds of different boats parked in their driveway, uh, either during the summer waiting to go launch them or during the winter uh, keeping them out of harm's way, et cetera. What, what, what kind of boats and boating, at, et cetera, are people looking at buying and dealing with in, in Niagara for the most part? Yeah, everybody has different, different boating needs, so to say. Um, Legend, I think, does a good job because the boats can be, they have full-down back seats, so you have a, uh, a platform you can fish up, and then you can, when you're out with the family and the kids, you want to go to lean and flip the seats up, and you can, you know, get the whole family on board. Now, you, you deal not only with Niagara, you deal in other areas as well, like Norfolk and Haldimand, and, uh, I mean, you supply boats and, and boating accessories to a lot of different communities, right? Yeah. Well, like you said, we we got lots of water around, so we're between <laughs> the Grand River there in Haldeman and you know the Niagara River. And there's there's a lot of boating. Boating has really changed over the years. There's a lot of new boaters, especially through the pandemic. You know when we couldn't leave and yeah. all that. So the outdoor activities became really big. I was going to ask you about that actually. I was going to I was going to suggest to you that perhaps the the pandemic that we went through. Uh, maybe saw an increase in people escaping to the water. Did that actually happen here? Oh yeah, yeah. A lot. We 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 encountered a lot of new boaters coming in, guys buying boats there. Well, they, we, we couldn't we couldn't travel. We couldn't do anything. And right. People, was, well, not only boats, but just the outdoors. You know, canoes, bicycles, camping, everything. It's, so it brought, brought a lot of people, I think, back to realizing we have a lot of great opportunities right here in Niagara to do all the things you want to do, uh, your outdoor activities. So what kind of other, other than out and out sales, uh, what, what sort of other services uh, and support do you offer Niagara boaters uh, at Hartzell Marine? Uh, we service all makes and models. So we do all repairs, we do trailer repairs, are basically the one-stop shop for all your boating needs, parts, accessories, um, selling fish blinders, downriggers, you know, we even have tubes for, you know, you want to go tubing with the family. We, we have everything. You're sitting in uh, what looks like your parts department. <laughs> Is that where you are? Yeah. Sitting in my parts department in a boat. <laughs> Just sitting in a boat. What 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 kind of what kind of boat have you got? What what kind of I'm boat are you in? in? Eighteen foot a Legend XTR. Okay. Used primarily for all kinds of recreation. Yeah, it's it's a good universal boat. Like I said, with the fold down seats, so the the back deck becomes a fishing platform to pull the seats down. Okay. And, and the front platform, so you can put your seat up there and fish off the front. So then when you're out with the family, you just flip the seats up and put in your tubing pole and away you go tubing with the kids. So as far as the, uh, as far as parts are concerned, how do, I guess people, much like car owners, you never know when you're going to need some kind of part for some kind of thing. How do, how do they, how do they deal with you when they need a specific part that maybe isn't commonly accessible? Well, we, we, you know, we're a, a Mercury dealer, so we can get parts right, right from them. Um, but we also service all makes and models. So we, we have an aftermarket, so we can get parts for Johnsons and Nevroods, Hondas. So we service a model, just just like my car business was. We service all makes and models, so right. we want to be your one-stop shop. And we're in, that, we're in that time where pretty much uh, recreational boating has uh, floated to a stop. You might say, "What a let's." If I'm a new boat owner, um, how do I make sure that, and without spending a fortune, how do I make sure my boat's going to be okay over the winter? What do I do? So, so we have different packages. So, if if you buy a boat from us, so we can sell you a two-year service package. It's not mandatory, but if you're a new boater, you want to take care of it. So. Um, from the time you buy it to, to the time you store it, we do everything we need. We bring it back in the fall and we'll winterize it, shrink wrap and store it. And right now we're, we're doing, if you buy a new boat, we'll give you that package for two years. We'll store your boat. And so that there's no worries and you don't have to worry about, oh, what do I do and how do I do this? So we, we take care of it all. We walk you through step by step of all everything you're going to need. And so you know what to expect. There's no surprises. 
you mentioned uh, you mentioned that term shrink wrap. I've never been a boat owner. Uh, maybe one day I will be, uh, especially if fuel prices uh, go down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I know quite a number of people that have been boat owners their entire lives, and this this shrink wrapping, where it's a it's it's almost like just sucking all the air out, and you it's like in glad wrap, you know. I mean, I've seen it. I, I've seen what. But is that really is how necessary is that? Can I get away without doing that, or is it uh, is it something that's advisable? It's advisable because you don't you don't want you know snow in your boat and then you know the more it's weathered the more things are going to go wrong with it. So when we shrink wrap it, we build a frame and we you know cover it in plastic and then we have a great big heat gun and it just shrinks the shrinks the plastic so it's nice and tight so all the snow and rain and everything falls right off it and and it's tight around it so no animals can crawl in in the winter time. Like we've opened up some boats and we've seen raccoons in there nests and everything. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's the way you get from just putting a tarp on it. So the shrink wrap is tight to the boat so no animals can get in there. And um, I know that uh, we're going to let you go here in a second, but I know that um, people always have all kinds of questions, but you're easy easy to find. Uh, Hartzelmarine.com, that's still your your website yes, address? Yep. So, and I'm, I'm assuming that... Uh, now, maybe I shouldn't assume, but I am assuming that in spite of the fact that we have winter coming that you're a year-round business people can talk to you around the calendar yeah so we, we save all our major jobs because like i said we do everything if um your, your transom is where your motor attaches at the back of the boat sometimes they get rotted so transom repair floors sometimes get rotted we do all that if you need engine rebuilds and stuff like that so so we we keep busy 20, 12 months a year do you deal with any classic boats like uh, the old the old wooden inboards and those those great classic shiny old wooden boats? Do you deal with any of those? Uh, no, we don't. We've had a few customers that have them that bring them in for service, but no, uh, the wooden boats are pretty well. Uh, you know, got to find tonight now with the fiberglass and aluminum. Yeah, they're an they're antiques now. They're museum pieces now. So yeah. Now, there, there's a groups out there that are just antique boat collectors, but um, most of those guys are pretty handy themselves because they need to be restored from the ground up. So. All right. Dave DeGrave uh, of Hartzell Marine, uh, again, thank you for sponsoring the program. It's been, uh, it's been great to have you, uh, as we say, on board uh, the program for the last uh, number of weeks. Good luck uh, with the coming winter and uh, your business, and we really appreciate the information. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Lee. Take care. Have a good day. Dave Grave, owner, uh, founder, Hartzell Marine, Ormond Street in Thoreau. So much stuff, so many different things there are to know, Kevin, <laughs> in, the, in the world today. And while we're at it, I want to thank once again, uh, before we uh, take off and listen to Joe Lavoie uh, to play us off the stage, Gales Gaspars Limited, thank you very much for, uh, as always, being our premier sponsor here on Niagara 411 Live with Lee Sterry. Verge Insurance Group Limited, uh, Blake Shirk and, uh, and crew, and uh, founder Mark, uh, another great Niagara company. Home, auto, personal insurance, uh, whatever your needs, they are insurance brokers and they'll find you the coverage you need at the price you can afford for whatever your insurance needs here in, uh, in the Niagara Peninsula. Also, Ace Alignment, uh, Janice Purdy, um, pretty and her uh, and her group there just do a, a fabulous job, and uh, I know uh, Janice and her family they, they've been through a they've been through a tough year Lo lost a, a few members of of their family close members and uh, I just want to mention uh, here in front of all that uh, our thoughts are are with you and our condolences to your family for the losses that you've suffered because it's been kind of a tough year. Uh, for the family and for that we're we're very sorry and uh, our hearts are with you so we appreciate your sponsorship in the program all of you that are involved with uh, ace alignment in particular and um, Lee along those lines I know uh, Janice is connected to this family and uh, a dear friend of mine uh, lost his father last night and he was a um, actually early this morning an icon 
in local racing is Ivan Little. Oh Passed yeah, away, uh, right. driving Ivan. Yeah, number number sixty one. Um, I've been friends with his son James for twenty some odd is years. Is that right? Now. I did not know that. And um, the family recently lost Ivan. Lost his wife of many years, probably in the last couple of months, and now Ivan's passed away. So. Uh, my heartfelt condolences to James um, and everybody that, uh, yeah, and that I, knew and loved the family. And I knew very, I, I know that he was uh, very close, uh, connected, related to the to the Pretty family and uh, Ace Alignment and that and that racing group. Eric Thomas, a, a close friend of mine, and uh, and this program founder and host of Raceline Radio across the country now in their. 30th year, 25th, I've been going for a long, long time. Um, all, of, um, all of the folks in that community, in our community, um, our thoughts are with you and we're sorry for your, for your many unfortunate losses uh, over the past year. Kevin, as always, it's a pleasure to, to, to work with you. One of these days, maybe I'll um, coerce you back into doing a weekly show because every two weeks I, I just I just miss hanging around you. I go through Kevin withdrawal. And I hear you, Lee. <laughs> uh, and and by the way, uh, if you have an interest, uh, and we only have a maximum of four sponsors on the program, uh, to use a racing term uh, or, or reference. We're not like NASCAR in the fact that we have 800 logos on our screen. We have just four every week. Gales, of course, is our premier sponsor, and we have three more that you can see, Verge, Ace Alignment, Hearts of Marine. And occasionally a sponsorship opportunity will come up. And uh, if you run a business or own a business or know somebody who does that might benefit, Niagara in particular is what we would be looking at here, Niagara-based business, let us know. Get in touch with us. Just uh, send us an email or a, a post or a, a query on Facebook or through Niagara 411, and uh, we'll uh, we'll let you know when a sponsorship comes available. Kevin, uh, we're gonna, I think uh, we're gonna take off now. Yeah, Joe Lavoie, he's been on the program yeah. before. Great local entertainer. He's going to play us off the stage. What what piece are we gonna be watching? So it's called to? Retrace, and it's got a uh, interesting little animated video here. So look forward to sharing that with everyone. All right. Oh, thanks again to Fiddler's Poorhouse for uh, extending their hospitality. To us, as always, it's a wonderful spot to be able to come and spend some time every couple of weeks. All right, Joe Lavoie is going to play us off the stage. You guys have a, a great rest of the week, a super weekend, and a very mild beginning to your uh, winter. Thanks, Scott Sutherland. Thanks, uh, Dave DeRocco. Thanks, uh, Chris Dabrowski uh, and Dave DeGrave for being here today. Bye. <laughs>
echoes of your laughter they haunt me so Time.